Well, good afternoon again, folks. I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the uh, stories that you're, or the story, I should say, that you're reading for this week, because there's one main one, Paladin of the Lost Hour, that you're going to be taking a look at. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about paper number three as well, but I want to focus more on the story itself. And as I did last time with the Otto Binder stories uh, that you wrote about for paper number two, I want to mention that you're welcome to use any of the uh, biographical details that I mention right now in this video for your paper. In fact, as I've been going through paper number two and uh, I've been getting ready to send them back to you, um, or in some cases I may, may have already sent them back, um, I've noticed that some of you did a nice job with using some of those ideas from one of the Binder videos that I put up a week or two ago. And so you're welcome to do that. In fact, one of the reasons I try to give you some background information on the writers, which I would do if we were in class, if we were actually together in the classroom, is because I'd like you to use some of it. You know, you're welcome to, to quote from, if you want to call it class notes, or you just want to use some of the ideas that I'm sharing with you um, uh, to, to sort of provide context for these stories. So feel free to do that, particularly with this paper, because this paper, as I mentioned in the directions, uh, and these readings as well, are connected with the binders. So we're not really starting from scratch with this assignment. What we're doing is we're building on what we already did in the second paper. And by that, I mean, we already wrote about Binder, right? You, you've done a little bit of research on him uh, with the sources that I gave you, his essay, and also some of the other readings that were in the Binder folder. And now what we're doing is we're taking what we learned from the second paper, including material from the second paper. You can even probably reuse some of that Binder material for this, this third one. And we're trying to figure out how he influenced another writer, in this case, Harlan Ellison. And I'm going to talk again a little bit about Ellison here today so that you have some more background information on him, and maybe you'll also get some ideas for your, your paper. I may talk more about Ellison himself in this video, and then I'll do a separate one that's specifically on Paladin, but I wanted to sort of just get started with some background that might explain not only why uh, I've given you the topic that I've given you, because he was, an, uh, he was a big Otto Binder fan, and that's why I like to put these two writers together, uh, here in the first half of the semester, but also because his themes are very similar. So if you've already read Paladin, one of the things you've probably noticed is that theme of responsibility, the theme of friendship, the theme of, of compassion and sympathy for someone that is very different from you is something that Allison also wrote about a lot. And in the interview that I posted, the, the, or the excerpts from the interview that I, I posted with Allison, he talks about that. He talks about what he learned as a kid from reading these kinds of stories, not just I, Robot, which he would have read, not just uh, The Teacher from Mars, which he also would have read, but also some of Bender's comic books. And that's why I put up that story from the old Captain Marvel comics, which I hope you enjoy. It's uh, especially at this kind of gloomy time of year. I think something colorful like that is fun. Even if you're not a normal or not normally a comics reader, it's it's fun to read. And it's it's got it's got a message that's very similar uh, to I, Robot and to The Teacher from Mars. So again, before I mention anything about Ellis, in himself. Um, think about that as you're reading Paladin of the Lost Hour, if you watch the TV version of it, as you read the interview and those other resources that are in the folder, think about what this writer, what Harlan Ellison would have learned from reading Binder, especially when Ellison was a kid in Ohio, um, in Painesville, Ohio, and he was reading these stories and reading these comics. What would he have picked up? What kind of themes did he learn about from someone like Binder. And that's something we're going to look at also when we get into the midterm, into the second half of the semester, when we're reading the Ineo Asano book, when we're reading the John Porcelino book, which, by the way, should be in at the bookstore if you want to order it through them, that they should have received those last week. Um, when we read Sandra Cisneros in the second half or around the midterm of the semester, um, you're going to have more opportunities to see how these different writers influence each other and what kind of themes they share with each other. So let me tell you a little bit, little story about Ellison. Let me give you some background on him, and then I'm going to tell you a little story of my own uh, about one of my encounters with him many, many, many years ago that I think you might find interesting, and that I think ties in actually really well with this story. Um, so Ellison, as I mentioned, was born in Painesville, Ohio. That's that's not far from Cleveland, but it's far enough that he didn't really have. It was more of a suburban kind of world. Although again, he was born in the 1930s, so the suburbs back then, pre World War II, were not the suburbs that we see today. They were smaller. Um, and they were, um, well, you know, if, if you, if you know Palatine and if you live, if you live in Palatine or you, you know it well, there's the old downtown area, which is around 
the train station. That's the old part of the town. And eventually after World War II, it kind of spread out. And that's why eventually you got Harper, you know, the main campus there and some of those other areas of, of the town. But the suburbs that I'm talking about that Ellison would have grown up in looked more like what downtown Palatine still looks like, this kind of smaller space. It was a little far from Cleveland, which would have been the most major city around him. And I'm mentioning that because one of the things Ellison faced as a kid was the fact that he was one of the only Jewish kids in his town and definitely one of the only Jewish kids in his uh, grade school and, and probably also his high school. And so he was bullied a lot. So you can kind of see this theme emerging a little bit, at least with his first couple of stories that we're reading, right? Uh, and he talks about this pretty candidly in a lot of his interviews later in his life. He wrote about it a lot, not only in his stories, but also in his essays. I, this is one of his essay collections here. He was, he was, he was mostly a short story writer, also wrote a lot of essays, was never really a novelist. He only wrote one novel over the course of his life and a few novellas. So he primarily wrote shorter works, uh, screenplays, essays, uh, short stories. This is one of his uh, short story collections from, from the early 1980s. Um, so he tended to do shorter works um, in the course of his life. And one of the themes he always went back to was how much he struggled because not only was he one of the only Jewish kids in his town, and so there were a lot of anti-Semitic folks that... Um, that uh, uh, kids that really bullied him, which is probably why he was able to relate to something like The Teacher from Mars when he first read it. But he also was sort of small for his age, and he talks about this in some of his other interviews where, you know, he's a little, he was a smaller kid. Uh, even as an adult, he was, he was not, not a tall, tall individual. And so he says in a lot of his writings that he had to learn how to protect and defend himself as a little kid, because he was also not always sharing what was happening uh, to him at school with his mom and his dad, even though he was pretty close to them, um, and or with his sister. And so he talks a lot in his writings about learning how to fight, learning how to defend himself, learning how to use his facility with language. That's important. He learned, he figured out when he was a pretty little kid that he sort of had an affinity for language that he um, not only was interested in stories, but wanted to tell stories himself. So one of the ways he was able to get out of a lot of these conflicts as a kid was he could talk his way out of it. And if you watch any interviews with him, which are, there's a lot of them on YouTube, um, he was a talker. He could really talk your ear off. Uh, and he also didn't take, um, well, as my dad says, he didn't, he didn't suffer fools kindly. So anyone that he thought was trying to be uh, uh, bullying towards him or towards others, um, w was someone that he would react against and, and would use his facility with language to argue against. And just to kind of project forward, if you read uh, some of the details in the interviews I've put up, he also, uh, in the early 1960s, um, walked uh, during protests during the civil rights movement. He, he, he uh, thought that that was part of his sort of civic responsibility, especially as someone who was not himself, um, you know, a person of color. But because of his experiences getting getting beat up in some cases uh, when he was a little kid, he felt that affinity. He felt that affinity and he felt a sense of duty and responsibility. And that's why one thing you're going to notice when you read Paladin of the Lost Hour is that the characters are almost versions of himself. The character Gaspar keeps talking about responsibility and how he feels responsible for everything in his neighborhood. That sort of was Ellison's uh, philosophy, and he wasn't always perfect at it. And like any person, he wasn't he wasn't p perfect. He was flawed. He could get a little overly aggressive with people at times, um, but he he definitely had an ethic that he lived by, which he traced back to those that small town those small town roots that he had in Painesville. Now, um, it's what he did after he graduated from high school is that he did uh, do about a semester, maybe a year. I don't remember if it was a full year at Ohio State University or only a semester. And he dropped out pretty early on because he, again, wanted to become a professional writer and thought that his best opportunity to do that would be first to move, for example, to here in Chicago. So he, this is another reason why I like incorporating him into this class with Stuart Dybeck and and Binder, and then Cisneros, who we're going to get to, and John Porcelino, because he wasn't a Chicago writer for very long, but he was here. He got his start. Uh, he lived in Evanston, you know, which is just north of the city, and wrote for some magazines, and I think also served as sort of an editor on uh, on some of some of that work in the uh, 1950s before he moved to New York. Didn't sp spend a lot of time in New York. Also got some experience there as a writer, 
and then moved to Los Angeles in the early 1960s and spent the rest of his life there. He passed away just just a couple of years ago in 2018 uh, and lived most of his life in L.A. And he went out there because he realized that to make a living, uh, you couldn't make a living anymore by the 1960s writing for those science fiction magazines and, and the kind of magazines that Otto Binder wrote for. To make a living, you had to go to Hollywood and you had to write for television or you had to write for movies. And that's what he did most for uh, uh, in most of his career. In fact, the money that he probably made writing for television, which he did quite a bit, he wrote for all, these, all kinds of different TV shows in the 1960s, including Star Trek, including The Outer Limits and all these other shows. Um, that's where he made his living so that he could write his books. Okay, so he he sort of made a living as a screenwriter and then committed a lot of his time to his short stories and to his essays. And as I mentioned, also his, to, to his political activism. He was very active up until the last few years of his life in ad, advocating for civil rights, uh, for for writer the rights of writers um, and their publication rights uh, in terms of their relationship with, with publishers. So he's an interesting figure. Um, and I think, you know, he's one of those people that now that he's passed away, um, I think there's there's sort of more recognition of some of his work. Um, so I hope you find it interesting when you read his pieces. And um, as I said, I want to tell you a story about him that my mom actually still laughs about. When I was in, uh, in high school, I, w I served as the uh, editor for the uh, sort of feature section of our school newspaper. I actually just found out last week that my high school, Sacred Heart High School in Waterbury, Connecticut, is closing. I couldn't believe it. I was actually really sad to hear that. I, I mean, I graduated 30 years ago, um, but even my dad went to that high school. My, my sister went there, and it's been open for almost 100 years. But again, as a Catholic school, they weren't able to sustain it anymore. Um, and that, anyway, that was sad news. I'm not on topic here with Howard and Ellison, but I, you never think your high school is going to close, even though I haven't been back to visit there and probably... I think 20 years ago, I visited one of my old teachers. Uh, but at any rate, I was the uh, I was an editor on my school newspaper when I was in high school, and I got into a little trouble. I wrote an article that um, uh, the class president didn't like, and he he got a little angry at me. I wouldn't say he was bullying me, um, but but it, it got close. There was I don't even remember what the article was about. I think he'd been c criticizing our sports editor, and she was a friend of mine. And some of the other sports staff were, were good friends of mine, the, the sports page uh, writers. And um, I, I think I was trying to maybe imitate Harlan Ellison. I'm like, I need to, def to defend my co-editors from something something insulting that the uh, the class president had said. I don't even remember what it was now because it's so long ago. But at any rate, uh, I wrote this article for the school newspaper criticizing the school president. He took me to task for that. He, he had some of his friends who were a little threatening towards me. And so what I decided to do, I had a P.O. box for Harlan Ellison. I don't know. I, I think I found it through maybe some magazine that I had at the time. And I wrote him a letter. Uh, you know, I, I actually, I clipped out my article from my school newspaper and I wrote to him and I said, you know, I was sort of trying to imitate you. I thought I would try to defend my co-editors because they were being made fun of by our class president. And as it turned out, they all got threatening towards me and, and are very angry at me. And, and if you have any advice for me as a young writer, please let me know. I didn't think I'd hear back from him. And then two weeks later, this was my senior year of high school, uh, the phone rang and, in our house. And my mom, who was downstairs, I was in my room studying for, I think, a test on the glass menagerie. And I heard my mom call up from downstairs and she said, Brian, get on the phone. And nobody ever called me after school. I mean, everybody was doing homework, so I didn't think it was any friends of mine. I wasn't planning to hear from anybody. Um, and so I, I ambled over to the phone up that we had upstairs, and, and I, I picked it up. Uh, and before I picked it up, my mom said, Harlan Ellison is on the phone for you. And my mom has a good sense of humor. And so I thought she was messing with me. You know, I, I, I'm like, she, she's kidding. This must be some friend of mine or whatever. Sure enough, I picked up the phone, and it was Harlan Ellison on the phone. Uh, and uh, he said, "Is this is this Brian Cremens?" I said, "Yep, uh, yes, it is." And I was pretty intimidated because I recognized his voice. I'd seen him in some documentary at that time. He said, "I got your letter. I read your article." And, and he said, let me, let me explain to you what you did wrong and why, why these people are angry at you for writing this article. Uh, he, he used a swear or two, which I won't, I won't use. He said, let me tell you about your article here. And he said, the reason that they don't like you 
And the reason that your article was not effective in, in defending your co-editors is like, he said, you don't have a thesis. That's the problem. He said, if you had a thesis, the audience would know what you were talking about. And he said, you got to have a good thesis. If you don't have a good thesis, then you are going to take a lot of criticism and, and people might make fun of you. And that's not a good thing if that happens. Um, but he's like, you got to work on, on better thesis statements. And he talked to me for at least 40 minutes, like 30 or 40 minutes um, about writing, about how to develop thesis statements. Uh, you know, I think about it now, I'm kind of emotional about it because the fact that this professional writer would not only read the silly article that I wrote as a, as a 16 or 17 year old, um, but that he would also take the time to look up my phone, my phone number. I, I might have put it in the letter. I don't remember, although I, I don't know if I did. But back then, you know, even now you could look it up in the phone book. Um, and the fact that he would take that much time to talk to me has never left me. It's always it's always uh, resonated with me because he was one of those people that I realized was kind of the real deal. Like what I was seeing in his writing for all his flaws, and he, he could be dif a difficult person I've heard from, from other people that knew him. Um, he really had a sense of responsibility, that he really took the time to talk to this silly kid from Connecticut, you know, a whole country away, that he would call me from Los Angeles and take a half hour hour out of his day and give me some advice on how to write a good thesis and how to uh and how to how to develop as a writer and and that meant a lot to me i, I mean even now thinking about it um 30 31 years later um i, I you know I, I feel that gratitude towards him and i was able to thank him i i did do that interview with him uh about seven years ago now and i don't think he remembered the phone call i mentioned it to him and i i just said thank you i really was glad that i had that opportunity just to briefly talk with him to do the little interview uh, a few years ago with him and, and to really share share that sense of gratitude that I had because I know that that had a major impact on me and on the rest of my life, uh, not only on, a, on my writing but on my teaching because I feel that responsibility now too to kind of pass that on, that encouragement and that, that sense of uh, responsibility. So I tell you that story because when you're reading Palette of the Lost Hour and you're thinking about how it connects back with Otto Binder, I think what you're going to see is that Ellison did learn a lot from Binder's stories. I think he took them seriously in the same way that a lot of you in your paper said that, that Binder took Campbell's letter seriously from the editor. Uh, I think he really, really um, read those stories and, and wanted to build on them and wanted to create stories that would affect people emotionally, that would let, make people think, that would give people encouragement if they felt that they were uh, if they felt they were outsiders or if they felt that people didn't understand them or if they felt lonely. He's got a lot of stories too about like loneliness and feeling and feeling uh, uh, separated from, from other people, which I'm sure came from his childhood. In fact, if you read that interview where he talks about Bender, I think he says something about that, that reading those comics as a kid gave him a sense that there was someone else out there that maybe would have understood him. And and I think that he, and I've talked to other people that, that he would do things like that. He would do these sort of generous little phone calls where he would call people up and say, here's what I think you should do in your writing. Here's, here's, what, um, here's what I would recommend. And the person that he most influenced, by the way, and then I'll mention a couple of last things and I'll wrap up with this video, is a writer named Octavia Butler. Uh, if you haven't read Octavia Butler, she also passed away in 2005 or six, I think great fantasy horror science fiction writer and one of her first teachers was Ellison he taught uh, a class or two on science fiction writing and just writing in general not just on science fiction in the 70s in Los Angeles and Octavia Butler took his class and and he became a mentor for her and she's one of the best kind of fantasy sci-fi writers I think of the last 30 years or so and she traced that back to him I have a feeling if he decided he wanted to become a teacher he would have been a fantastic uh, a writing teacher if he did it more regularly because he clearly had that 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 sensibility and that kind of generosity that it's important to have um, so when you read Paladin uh, there's a lot of autobiography in it I think when when he shows you that friendship between Gaspar and through Billy He's really thinking about maybe friends in his own life. He's thinking about some of the issues that Bender was writing about. Um, and I hope that you enjoy it because I know we're all struggling right now with a lot of challenges with these feelings of loneliness and anxiety and, and separation and, 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 and fear. And I think he, one of the reasons I, I started using his stories again last semester, or not last semester, last spring actually, I had never really, I hadn't taught him in a while. And I realized, I kept trying to think of people 
when we went into the lockdown last spring, halfway through the semester, I said, what writers can I pick that might give everybody a little inspiration, a little boost, you know, especially if you're feeling down, you're feeling anxious, you're feeling uh, uh, scared. I, you know, I said, you know what, Ellison... Ellison gave me that confidence when I was 16 or 17. And I've talked to a lot of other of his readers that said the same thing. They read him and they said, oh, I didn't feel as alone when I read that. I felt like, yeah, I can, I can get through some of this, this stuff. So I hope when you're reading it, you know, you're going to write about it. You're going to do a little analysis of it. But I hope that you feel some of his uh, his spirit in it. I don't know how else to describe it because I think he was, for again, for, for as difficult as he could sometimes be from what I've heard from other people in terms of... Uh, um, <laughs> Again, he didn't take any nonsense from anyone, I guess, uh, we'll say. Um, he was also very generous, and I think there's that spirit in his stories of of, of encouragement and uh, of inspiration. So I hope you pick up on some of that in Paladin. And I hope you like the uh, TV version, too, because the acting in that is great. Glenn Turman's a fantastic actor. Danny Kaye's amazing. It doesn't have all the details of the story, but Ellison did write the screenplay for it. And uh, I think he, those actors really captured the emotional bond that these two characters have. Uh, the same kind of bond that um, I think uh, Monzero's wishes that he, or well, it did sort of have, as some of you said, with the robot Oscar in the story, or that um, uh, Adam Link developed with, with Dr. Link in those stories. So as I said at the very beginning of class, that's one of the big themes of all these pieces that we're reading is friendship. You know, the, the link and the bond that develops between characters who may not seem to have anything in common, which is the case with Gaspar and uh, Billy in this story. So anyway, there's my little story for you about Allison. I'll, I'll do another video this week where I'll talk more about the story specifically and also what his inspiration was because that's that other little essay I gave you where he talks about actually speaking with one of his friends and, and how she uh, gave him some of the ideas for this piece. Uh, and I'll talk more again about the structure of the essay. But again, this is a, a we're building on paper number two with paper number three. So it's we're not starting from scratch. So I want you to keep that in mind. Um, so in the meantime, I hope you're doing well. Uh, again, I'll be back in the next couple of days with another video more specifically on the structure of the story. And in the meantime, I hope you enjoy reading it and I hope you take some uh, inspiration and maybe even some comfort from it if you're, if, uh, you know, you're struggling a little bit here in, in the, in the, as we get to the middle or towards the middle of the semester and we're, we're we have all these snowstorms and uh, cloudy days and everything. All right. So uh, take care of yourselves. I'll be back in the next couple of days with a little more on Harlan Ellison and on paper number three. See you then.